I now call to order the society's 2,414th meeting in the 149th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Neil Deveraj in the Don Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC, including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Sciences YouTube channel. We will begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2,413th meeting and the lecture by Ben Reed on mortal satellites. We'll then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. When the Q&A is done, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements. Thank those who make PSW possible and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2019-2020 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous sponsor who is asked to remain anonymous. Please also join me in thanking the sponsor of this lecture, PSW member Jerry Snellman Arasowicz, a longtime member who is curator of gastropods emeritus at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History and a world explorer who often gets into a deep submersible and goes everywhere to find interesting gastropods. So please join me in thanking them all. Please also join me in thanking one of the members of the general committee and lecture crew who keeps this organization running and growing. And tonight we have a special thank you for PSW member at large, for social media, Ann McQueen, who tweets, updates Meetup, Eventbrite, and Facebook, manages Sign Up Genius, manages the room, handles live chat, sometimes run, runs microphones, handles rosettes, and throws summer parties, among other things. And we thank you, Ann, for all your many contributions to PSW. Yay! <laughs> A bit of an update on PSW News, by the way. There are 20,150 20, views of PSW videos just last month in September on the PSW Science YouTube channel. The average view was over 30 minutes, which means that most viewers are watching the lectures from beginning to end. In all, people from all over the world spent five 173,147 minutes, which is to say 9,552 hours, watching PSW videos. That's sort of astonishing to me. <laughs> and for those of you who are not familiar with PSW, these recordings are the record of the society's meetings, not just the lectures themselves. And it's all done by unpaid volunteers. So please thank the volunteers and everybody who makes these lectures and these recordings possible. Yay, team. And I am pleased to announce 
to the following new members have been elected to the society. Sandy Maple, a software development manager with Capital One, interested in astrophysics, material science, and information systems, who comes to PSW through the PSW meetup group. Ava Schwartz, or Schwarz, a young and enthusiastic student, space camp graduate, interested in astronomy, physics, mathematics, and organic chemistry, although not yet graduated from high school, who comes to PSW through attending a recent event. And Ava, if you happen to be in the audience, please come and see me afterwards. We want to harness some of that energy and enthusiasm. Scott Benton, a university administrator at UCSD, interested in microbiomics and neurosciences, who comes to PSW through PSW member Larry Milstein. That would be me. And tonight's speaker, Neil Deverage, whose background and interests will be clear to you in small part from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to membership. All new members can receive a signed copy of volume one of the PSW Bolton. If you'd like to pick yours up, if you're a new member who hasn't yet received your copy, please see me after the lecture. Also, all members in good standing are entitled to purchase a ribbon of PSW. And if you have purchased one but haven't picked it up or you would like to purchase one, please see social media director Ann McQueen, who is manning the ribbon table after the lecture. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2413th meeting and the lecture by Ben Reed on Immortal Spacecraft, The Rise of In-Space Servicing Assembly and Manufacturing, delivered to society and guests on October 4th, 2019, right here in the Powell Auditorium. James, the podium is yours. Thanks, Larry. Well, as Larry just told you, uh, on October 4th, 2019, in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium in the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called the 2,413th meeting of the Society to order at 8.01 p.m. He announced the order of business, that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet, and welcomed new members to the Society. The minutes of the previous meeting were then read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Benjamin Reed. Deputy Director of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center's Satellite Servicing Projects Division. His lecture was titled, Immortal Spacecraft, The Rise of In-Space Servicing, Assembling, and Manufacturing. Reed said that servicing craft in space is not new. The first such mission being by astronaut Edward Gibson to repair a thermal shield on Skylab. But recent taxpayer-funded investments now allow conception and engineering of unmanned satellite servicing missions. These technologies and capabilities will be applicable to future manned exploration missions. Ground observatories are limited by weather and Earth's atmosphere, whereas satellite observation is relatively uninhibited. However, the challenges of maintaining satellites include the vacuum of space, which cause low molecular weight polymers to evolve out of plastics and create a film on mirrors and lenses, and orbital debris, which can potentially destroy spacecraft. Reaching a satellite to repair it is further complicated by Earth's gravity well and the vastness of space. For these reasons, cost and inaccessibility have held back satellite servicing missions. Development of a robotic arm with seven degrees of freedom has made repair missions more feasible. Reed said, NASA's successful repair and upgrade missions to the Hubble Space Telescope are proof of concept that such missions are worthwhile. He said, installations of new instruments have made Hubble 10,000 times more powerful today than when it was launched. But unlike Hubble, 
there are thousands of launched satellites that were not designed for servicing. NASA has embarked on a technology development program to develop capabilities to service these craft. Reed described the RAVEN, robotic refueling missions one through three, and robotic external leak locator test missions run on the International Space Station used to practice autonomous tracking, remote tool use, and repair on a client part not designed for repair. Arising from those test missions is RESTORE-L, a four-phase servicing mission to the 20-year-old Landsat-7 satellite, which, unlike Hubble, has no doorknobs or reflectors to aid servicing. Reed described in detail each of the four mission phases. Autonomous rendezvous and inspection, autonomous capture, telerobotic refuel and relocation, and telerobotic assembly and manufacture. The, go the goal of Restore-L is to set a global precedent on how to safely repair both government-operated and commercial satellites not designed for repair. In pursuit of that goal, NASA will conduct the entire mission on NASA TV. In the short term, Reed believes his team's work will encourage satellite operators to either refuel or repair existing crafts, or to launch future satellites with more instruments using more fuel at launch to be refueled once in orbit. Reed also believes on-orbit assembly will create funding efficiencies whereby designers can save resources designing whole craft to fit into a single launch vehicle because they can assemble multiple components in space. And further into the future, Reed believes the technologies and capabilities currently in development can be used to assemble distant craft such as star shades. He also believes these developments will lead to off-planet manufacture of tools and equipment, potentially facilitating a mission for manufacturing equipment to bring explorers home from other planets. Reed concluded by stating his belief that the immortal spaceship, a craft that is continually updated and repaired without a foreseeable termination of service date, is within scientific grasp. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.38 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting to the social hour. Temperature, 19 degrees Celsius. Weather, clear. Attendance in the Powell Auditorium, 88, and viewing through the live stream on the PSW Science YouTube channel, 37. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. Are there any comments on the minutes? Are there any corrections? If not, I will entertain a motion by a member to accept the minutes as read. I will entertain a second. All in favor, all members in favor say aye, or all members opposed say nay. Not hearing any nays and hearing a lot of ayes, I will uh, deem that the minutes have been accepted as read and will be posted to the website in due course. Thank you, James. And we now turn to tonight's lecture on bottom-up synthetic biology. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Neil Devaraj. Neil is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry Chemistry and Chemistry, or Chemistry and Biochemistry, and in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of California, San Diego. Neil is interested in understanding how non-living matter can assemble to form life. Toward that end, he's developed methods for in situ synthesis of synthetic cell membranes by selectively stitching lipid fragments together. This work enabled the first demonstration of perpetually self-reproducing lipid vesicles and artificial membranes that dynamically remodel their chemical structure. Recently, his lab demonstrated in situ synthesis of lipid species in living cells, opening the door to studies to unravel how lipid structures affect cellular function Neil speaks to technical audiences frequently, has given over 80 invited lectures, 
and is an author on more than 60 peer-reviewed publications. Among numerous honors, Neil is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Natural Sciences. He is a Blavatnik National Laureate in Chemistry. He received the American Chemical Society Award in Pure Chemistry and the ACS's National Fresnius Award. And he was named Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar for his outstanding teaching in chemistry. Neil earned a BS in biology and chemistry at MIT and a PhD in chemistry at Stanford University. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming Neil to the podium. Thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you, thank the PSW for this uh, invitation to speak here tonight. I've confessed that I've also gone on YouTube and contributed to watching PSW videos and some of those hours and minutes that Larry mentioned. And so it's really a, a privilege and an honor to be able to give one of these lectures today. So scientists believe the Earth was formed about five billion years ago. And a billion years after its formation, single cell unicellular life appeared. And a billion years after that, it's believed that multicellular life appeared. And our own species, very young, only 200,000 years ago. And so there are a lot of really good theories and ideas for how simple single cell life eventually evolved to organisms as complex as ourselves. But this first step, how did non-living matter make this transition into life is in many ways a virtual black box. I think it's one of the most important, though most difficult problems in the sciences today. It literally is this transition of how does chemistry become biology. And so for that reason, there are many scientists and groups working on trying to understand what could be sort of a minimal living unit. As I'll discuss, the definition of what life is is notoriously complex and challenging. But I think most will agree that the minimal unit of life is the cell. And there have been a lot of interest then in trying to develop ways to make minimal living units, these cells, so-called synthetic cells or artificial cells. One general approach is what I would call a bottom-up approach. And it's kind of typified here by, who I put actually um, one of the founding faculty members of University of California, San Diego, Stanley Miller, and his extremely famous Miller uh, Urey experiment where he showed that spark discharges and water and some simple precursors could actually lead to amino acids, one of the you know, essential building blocks of life. And so the idea then is to really, can you take simple molecules or components that are clearly not living and put them together to make something that you would consider a cell? On the flip side, there are what I would call top-down approaches. And so for the top-down approach, the idea is to take cells that already ex exist, extant living organisms, and try to strip away their functionality and simplify them and try to get them as simple as possible so that you arrive at this minimal living cell. Now, another approach is to potentially consider not working with compounds that are, say, related to the origin of life and prebiotically relevant, or potentially molecules and compounds that are relevant to extant living organisms. And just think about using anything we have at our disposal, whether it's you know, abiotic or not, whether it was potentially found on the early earth or not, and try to put them together to try to create materials that mimic the form or function of life. These so-called, in my title of my talk, lifelike uh, materials. 
And so just to give a couple examples of sort of this bottom-up versus top-down approach, here I show an example of sort of what would bottom-up minimal cell reproduction look like, taken from a very well-known review article, showing that perhaps the earliest simple cells could have just been a compartment composed of lipids, and inside this compartment, there is a very simple catalyst, like a piece of RNA or an enzyme or protein. And somehow, this compartment gained the ability to grow and divide. And this was able to occur multiple times over and over again. And so if you could actually put together this sort of reproducing compartment from very simple starting blocks, these, these lipids and these enzymes and catalysts, that would be sort of a bottom-up approach. Now, an example of a top-down approach has been this really remarkable work that's been in the literature where various scientists have been able to actually synthesize whole genomes. And what's been shown, I think a really great example of this is work from the J. Craig Venter Institute where they've shown that they can actually synthesize complete genomes and insert them into organisms and create kind of a new organism. And so this, of course, still utilizes a living organism to, to begin with, and it also yields a very complicated system. And so this is just an example of a top-down approach, but you still have to work within sort of the biological rule book because you're still working with current biology. And so in my talk today, as the title implies, I'm really going to focus on bottom-up approaches to try to construct these sort of lifelike materials. And so I thought I would maybe speak a little bit of the benefits potentially of this bottom-up construction. In a way, it's more challenging because from the top-down approach, we already have cells all around us that we can manipulate and use. Why go to the trouble of trying to create something that already exists? And uh, I have an analogy here, and I'm not sure if it's exactly the best analogy, but I'll, I'll, I'll work, work through it, in that I think when you go from the bottom up, we have, one, the possibility to better understand what life is and what are sort of the necessary ingredients to create life de novo that you won't necessarily get from a top-down approach. But additionally, we have the potential to make sort of synthetic life or a mimetic life that does things that are very different from what current biology does. And I liken this a little bit to thinking about creating um, different kinds of electronic devices, or in this case, the phone, where we can imagine that we have you know, an analog telephone, and we want to just engineer that analog telephone. And we could probably make it better, and we can you know, modify it. But if we really want to get to something like a smartphone, like an iPhone, that really the better thing is to actually think about redesigning it from the ground up to achieve those kinds of really new, different kinds of functionalities. And that would be something where a bottom-up approach might be advantageous. So in trying to create these sort of bottom-up approaches to lifelike materials, there have been many great examples in the literature already by scientists around the world. So people have been able to take um, artificial compartments and have protein synthesis take place within these compartments. You can reconstitute cytoskeletal proteins to basically control the shape of compartments similar to what happens in cells. And actually our own work, we're really interested in trying to create the compartments themselves, these lipid membranes. And why do we do this? So definitely there are really good reasons from a fundamental science perspective. So really trying to address this very basic question, what is life and how do we um, make this transition from non-living to living material? Also, we have an opportunity as we put particularly biological parts together, asking questions of how simplified, how simplify how, how can we simplify complex natural systems? Um, how minimal can we really go? What, what are sort of the minimal elements we need to get certain kinds of biological functions? And if we are successful, undoubtedly there would be applications. So thinking about creating sort of lifelike materials or artificial cells 
that would allow us to do sensing, drug delivery, um, manufacturing of novel kinds of materials. Some of the most interesting applications might be those applications where current living organisms are not able to do that. And so that's really kind of looking far into the future. But for instance, imagining um, applications where we would like to produce uh, molecules in conditions where normal life doesn't want to exist. For example, organic solvent. Or can we actually make materials that living organisms don't make? So mirror images of biological molecules like proteins or nucleic acids. And so what is really happening now in the field? So right now, because this is a very ambitious um, set of goals, it's a very nascent area of research, we're definitely doing work that's helping us better understand um, what life is through and, and how life may have originated. And there's quite a bit of work going on in this area by many uh, people in the field. And additionally, there's the development of new tools, uh, particularly new tools for trying to cr create sort of minimal biological units. And I also think that's an important point to bring up is that oftentimes when we're going after a really ambitious goal, it's, it's, it's in addition to the goal itself being an important and in a value, actually the road to that goal and creating tools to get to that achievement can be equally if not more valuable. Now, what about the future though? So if we really sort of look into the, into the future and think, well, 10 plus years from now, we do have the possibility if we really push in this area to try to come up with sort of really revolutionary materials, materials that really don't exist in biology, that wouldn't be feasible with current life forms. Um, for instance, can we create artificial blood that would be stable indefinitely at room temperature? This has been a holy grail in the field for some time. And going even further out in the future, and it's really hard to make a prediction here, it could be 20 years, it could be 50 years, it could be more, can we really think about artificial life? And along the way, there's, of course, this opportunity when you're going after these really challenging problems to be able to inspire and educate students and the public. Um, and I think that's also a really important um, value that we get from pursuing these kinds of objectives. So why do I talk about like life? Why not just talk about life? Um, it would be interesting to think about why don't we try to pursue research that creates life in the lab? Um, but this is really challenging for an interesting reason in the sense of how do we actually define what life is? Um, so you may think to yourself, well, gee, I, that doesn't make much sense. I know what life is. Um, life uses DNA, RNA, proteins. It you know, has a lipid membrane as its compartment. Um, it possesses a cytoskeleton. We, we see life all around us. But I think we have to be careful that we don't define what we know as life on Earth versus what life could be in a general sense from sort of very fundamental principles. And that's important because it could, right now there's a lot of active interest, for example, are there life, is there life on other planets? And if there is life on other planets, it may look radically different from the life on our own planet. And so it's, it's, I think it's more important that we start thinking about what are sort of the fundamental characteristics of life. And that's where it gets really challenging. So scientists, philosophers have thought about defining life for many, many years, and there still isn't really a consensus definition of what it means to be alive, surprisingly enough. So you might think, okay, well, maybe we, we make this more generalized, life reproduces, it consumes a chemical fuel, it grows. And so that, that sounds pretty good, but then so does fire, okay? And so this is the kind of problem that people run into when we start trying to define life. This is an example of perhaps something that we would think is not living, fire, that would fit into this category, but um, sort of the opposite problem can occur too. So here I discuss reproduction as one of the qualities, but then there are certain things that are clearly alive, like a mule that has lost the ability to reproduce. 
And so this is another issue that happens when you start thinking about how to define life. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two approaches from my own lab where we're trying to build these lifelike materials. And one story is going to talk about a bottom-up approach where we're trying to make these lifelike materials from very, very simple molecules. These molecules are, are not from living organisms. And really, it's trying to understand how can we think about maybe a truly de novo production of materials that mimic life. And in the second story, I'm going to talk again about another bottom-up approach from our lab, but where we're trying to make lifelike materials through combining various biological parts. So these are parts that we've derived from biology. And they clearly themselves are not very functional, but can we put them together in a way to make something that mimics um, a higher order function of life? So the cell is a very, very complex machine, if you will, um, and it has a lot of functionality. And so when we first began exploring in this field, it seemed very impractical to say, okay, we're just going to mimic every aspect of the cell. And so we really wanted, we decided to focus on trying to mimic the formation of compartments in cells. So many of you know this, but all living cells, their boundaries are defined by what are known as lipid bilayers. And these are sort of the real material of the compartments of cells. And these lipids, they com they're composed of monomers, such as phospholipids, that have a very polar head group and a very hydrophobic set of two tails, typically. And because you have a polar head group and two tails, this kind of a molecule, if you were to have, for example, oil and water, would orient itself in this kind of manner, with the, the greasy hydrophobic tails facing into the oil phase. And so the properties of this molecule, the fact that it has this polar side and this hydrophobic side, or this water-loving side and oil-loving side, make it so that it will, if you get enough of these molecules together, they'll actually self-assemble and form these bilayers. You can see that now there's two of these molecules where the tails are facing inward. And then this kind of bilayer can sort of wrap around itself in three dimensions and form a compartment, what we call a vesicle. And this compartment really resembles what you see in living organisms, in cell membranes, for example. And so why are we so interested in compartmentalization? So compartmentalization is extraordinarily important for life. It establishes physical boundaries for biological processes, so it keeps certain molecules in and others out. It defines cellular identity, and that's really important when you start thinking about things like Darwinian evolution and competition. So if we have a lot of simple cells and one gains an advantage, how, does it able, how is it able to maintain that advantage in competition? You need this sort of compartment to try to enable it to maintain the advantage, to not, basically to not share. And additionally, it, compartments give you the ability to, in space and time, control various processes. So what do I mean by that? So oftentimes, we would like to be able to do chemistries and biochemistries that are incompatible with one another. And how do you do that in one sort of organism? Well, one way to do that is to separate them and compartmentalize those processes. And so having this sort of three-dimensional compartmentalization allows you to do those kinds of functions. Now, the other reason we're really interested in trying to mimic the lipid membranes in these compartments is that lipids are extraordinarily important in cell biology. So as I pointed out, Lipids are key components of these compartments we have, lipid membranes, um, in the form of phospholipids and cholesterol. But lipids are also a major energy source in the form of fats or triglycerides. And there's various vitamins and hormones that are lipids. Lipids are really uh, thought to be ancient molecules. And so for that reason, they're thought to have played an important role in the origin of life. I briefly described how Many theorize that compartments made of li very simple lipids 
could have gained the ability to reproduce, and those may have been actually the first cells on this planet. There's been various studies that have shown that very, very simple chemistries that are likely prebiotically relevant can generate um, lipid species. And lipids also have this ability to, as I pointed out, to spontaneously self-assemble into compartments that resemble those of cell membranes. Really quite remarkable. So when you start thinking, though, about what kind of lipids then are you going to use, what kind of, what kind of Material, material are you going to use for making the compartments of these minimal cells or these lifelike cells? Um, we have several that we can choose from. So, in fact, for many of the origin of life studies, a very popular membrane material to work with are fatty acids. And so it turns out that actually just a simple hydrophobic chain terminated in a carboxylic acid at the right pH can remarkably self-assemble and form compartments that actually resemble those of cell membranes. And so this is really fascinating. It's been shown that fatty acids can be made using chemistry that's very simple, that's prebiotically relevant. And so a lot of really beautiful work has been done in the field showing that you can make minimal cells from these components. And another big advantage, actually, of the fatty acids is that the membranes, because they're quite simple, it turns out they're very permeable then to small molecules. And that's important because if we think about a primitive membrane that doesn't have very much machinery, how do we transport things in and out, nutrients, for example, or waste? And the ability to have sort of permeation to occur on its own spontaneously sort of gets around that issue. Now, one of the challenges has been that these fatty acids turn out to be not very compatible with modern biochemistry. So we have to keep the pH at a particular um, level. If we go too acidic or too basic, that's not good. Also, essential salts like magnesium and calcium will cause these membranes to crash out. And so that makes them somewhat challenging to work with, particularly if we start introducing other kinds of biologically relevant catalysts. And so in contrast, we can imagine working as a membrane material, phospholipids. And so phospholipids are what are found in our cell membranes. And the phospholipids can, as I pointed out, close up on each other after forming bilayers to form these vesicles with aqueous cavities. What's nice about phospholipids is that, obviously, they're compatible with biochemistry. I mean, we use them. What's challenging to work with them is that they are indeed impermeable to lots of small molecules. And so there is a need for transporters. But early on when we started this work, we decided that we really liked the stability of these phospholipid membranes and their compatibility. And we thought we would start developing chemistries that would allow us to mimic the formation of the phospholipid membranes. And then maybe worry about sort of a transport and impermeability later. Perhaps we could um, elaborate these membranes in later iterations. And so a little bit about why phospholipids are so special and why they can self-assemble to form these bilayers. So as I pointed out, phospholipids have a polar head group and they have two hydrophobic tails. And so actually, if you think about the shape of this molecule, it turns out to have a shape that's kind of like a cylinder. And because of that cylindrical shape, if you get many of these molecules together, they'll pack in such a way that it will form a planar bilayer. And that planar bilayer, when it closes in on itself, will form your vesicle. Now, in contrast, imagine we were to lop off one of these hydrophobic tails. Well, now we'd have a new molecule that, instead of having a cylindrical shape, would have a more conical shape to it. And if we imagine how that molecule would pack, if we had lots of those molecules, they would pack into what is called a micelle. So we don't have this bilayer anymore. We basically just have a monolayer of these molecules packed together into a little sphere. And so cells you know, utilize these phospholipid membranes, and they're made through a really complex sequence of enzymatic reactions. So we don't have to go into detail here, but basically there are a wide variety of catalytic reactions that have to occur to build up those hydrophobic tails 
and to install them on those polar head groups. And so it really seemed to us at the start, this would be very impractical to try to mimic all of these reactions in a artificial way to try to create lipid membranes. So instead, we gained inspiration from another type of phospholipid synthesis pathway in biology. And this pathway is known as the land cycle or the remodeling pathway. And what it is is basically we have ways in which we can take already formed phospholipids, or depicted here in red, that have two hydrophobic tails. And there are enzymes that will come along and basically just chop off one of those tails. And then another enzyme will come along and attach a new tail to that severed phospholipid, creating a new phospholipid, right, that has a different tail on it. And that's why it's called the remodeling path. We've actually kind of remodeled that particular molecule. And so to us, what was really interesting about this is that here we have a situation where we actually have two single chain precursors, they have two single hydrophobic chains. And because of that, their shape is such they're not gonna form membranes. And they're coming together in the presence of this enzyme to form a phospholipid that's got two hydrophobic tails. And so now this new molecule has the right shape that it can pack and form membranes. And so we have this great transformation where we can take two things that don't form membranes and in this case do an enzymatic reaction and form a membrane forming product. And so what we thought is, well, this is now just one coupling step. Maybe we could try to mimic it using abiological chemistry. And so one thought is to think about using very traditional organic chemistry. And so really typically in the organic chemistry field, we like to use very harsh solvents, um, potentially high temperatures. It tends to be extremely reactive. And so we really, we're wary of doing that because for one reason, we wanted to have still some biological compatibility. In fact, that's why we went to phospholipids. But additionally, we really wanted this to work in water. So all this sort of self-assembly that I'm talking about, the idea that these, these lipids will, will spontaneously form these beautiful compartments, we really need that to happen in water. And so the chemistry needs to happen in water. And so, to address that issue, we decided to turn to a kind of reaction that works very well in water. Okay, and so I'm gonna, now we're gonna enter the period of the talk where I'm gonna show you a lot of chemical structures. And it's always funny when I'm on the plane and I tell someone, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm an organic chemist or I, I, do, I do chemistry, that of course they turn to me and say, oh, that was my worst subject. <laughs> and I hated organic chemistry. I'm gonna to try to go through these structures and just explain to you some of the basics of why they're important and, when, and what the functionality is. So this is a reaction known as a click reaction. And it's known as a click reaction because what you have here is a alkyne here in red and an azide here in blue. And what happens is in the presence of a very simple catalyst, copper, these two red and blue groups will come together and form a new molecule known as a triazole. But really what's important to, to take away from this is this links these two groups together. So whatever was on that alkyne and azide, they get linked together by this chemistry. And hence the name click chemistry, a term pine, developed by Barry Sharpless. His chemistry is really uh, pioneered by him. And it's really high yielding it's compatible with lots of different kinds of functional groups, and it works well in water, which is very important for the self-assembly. And so we decided to ask, can we now take two single chain lipid precursors, neither of which can form membranes on their own, and use this click chemistry, the Sharpless click chemistry, to you know, click these two chains together and form a phospholipid product that would then assemble and form membranes. And can we do this all in water? And so we made new molecules that mimic in many ways the structure of 
the natural molecule. So this is basically a single chain phospholipid that we've installed that red alkyne group. And we now have a long hydrophobic single chain precursor where we've installed this blue azide. And in the presence of copper one, they come together and you click these two groups together and now you get a phospholipid with two hydrophobic chains. And you can actually mix these now in water and we can use microscopy to visualize the formation of lipid membranes. And so here is the microscopy. And so in the absence of this copper catalyst where we have no reaction, we don't see any membranes. But once we add copper in 30 minutes, you get to see these beautiful tubules and vesicles spontaneously form. And after many hours, you just get fields of these cell-like membranes. And this is, these are images, but you can also follow this using other kinds of characterization techniques like mass spectrometry. And so what's happening? How, how, how are we making these membranes? So it turns out that one of these precursors, the azide, is an oil. So we actually have little oil droplets in water. And what we really believe is that at the interface of these oil droplets and the water phase, we have reaction occurring and we're forming lots and lots of these membranes. And as these membranes get hydrated, as they're formed, they bud off and form these vesicles that are mimicking that of cell membranes. And some evidence for this comes from a movie I'm gonna play here, where what you should note here is this is a droplet of that azide oil. And we can already see by this bright staining here that there's a lot of membrane that's formed. And so as we watch, you can actually see a tubule form spontaneously at the interface between this oil phase and water phase. So one of the interesting things about this chemistry, this, the click chemistry, is azides and alkynes are not thought to be necessarily prebiotically relevant. So this is an example of where we're taking modern chemistry and applying it to this more general problem of how do we get sort of a cell mem membrane-like material to form. And after we had sort of demonstrated that this chemistry could work and we can make lipid membranes, we turned to a really challenging problem. And it was a problem in literature known as autopoiesis. So could we actually think about getting our system that makes membranes and vesicles to actually reproduce. And so this term autopoiesis comes um, from these Chilean biologists where it essentially means a system that's capable of reproducing and maintaining itself. And they really wanted to utilize this term to define the ability of cells to maintain themselves and to completely reproduce themselves. And so some chemists, in fact, some real pioneers in this whole area of developing synthetic cells, uh, Luigi Luisi and uh, Pasquale Stano, wrote a very interesting, for me at least, a very impactful review article where they talked about this concept of autopoiesis. And they, they set up a really hypothetical situation where what if you had sort of a compartment and this compartment consisted of an interior catalyst and a, the compartment itself was made from a material, which they put here as S, it's kind of hard to see. Could you feed precursors to this compartment and could the chemistry occur in such a way that both the catalyst and the shell or the, or the con container itself could, could make more of itself? And by doing so, the entire system could grow and potentially divide. And in theory, as long as you had enough precursor, this could go on indefinitely. Now, it may not be a perfect system, so I kind of liked this aspect here, where perhaps maybe you have a division event and one of these compartments doesn't have any catalyst in it. Well, it would just be dead. It wouldn't really go forward in this process. And so I thought this was a really exciting way of thinking about creating lifelike materials that could reproduce? Could we come up with a system that could um, follow these rules that 
um, Luisi and Stano set out in this paper. And so there are, you know, we, we basically demonstrated that we could have a catalyst, a very simple catalyst generating lipids that form a compartment. And in fact, in the literature, there, there are many examples of using catalysts to generate lipids or compartment material. But as you make more and more of this compartment material, you're eventually going to dilute out the catalyst. And the catalyst concentration with respect to the compartment, the new lipid you're making, is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the reaction is going to get slower and slower and slower, and eventually it's going to stop. So how do we get around this problem? Well, the real answer would be to think about ways in which we can generate more catalyst. And so the real uh, idea here then would be, can we cr actually do this kind of system that Stano and Luisi proposed, but now have this catalyst be an autocatalyst? So what do I mean by autocatalyst? An autocatalyst is a catalyst that can make itself. And so if you have now a catalyst that can make itself and potentially also make this lipid material of the compartment, if you have the right precursors, in principle, this entire system could perpetually reproduce because you won't face this problem of catalyst dilution because a catalyst will make more of itself. Okay, so that sounds nice, but how do you actually do it? So we have a system now where we, we had created a way to make phospholipids and we can create these membranes and now we wanted a way to find a way so that we could have an autocatalyst coupled into this system. And if we do that, potentially we could get materials then that could grow and divide in response to very reactive precursors that would be cell-like. So as we were working with this click chemistry, which if you recall, uses these alkynes and azides, one thing that was really exciting to me about this chemistry that was developed by, again, the Sharpless group, was they had explored very early on that oligotriazoles, and these are basically molecules now that have more than one of these triazole linkage units, so in this case you have three, they had shown that when they tried to make these oligotriazoles, they surprisingly found that the reaction accelerated and got faster as you started making the compound. And that was really interesting. And they did some more studies and they realized that actually this species that has three of these triazole units can actually bind to copper and make copper a better catalyst for this click reaction. And so actually in the literature, and in fact it's interesting, this paper has thousands of citations, lots of people have been use, utilizing this particular ligand to help with this click reaction. But what it really sort of suggests though is that since this is a now um, copper triazole species, they can accelerate the formation of triazoles and it itself is made of triazoles, it should be able to, in theory, catalyze its own synthesis. And so we could imagine taking this oligotriazole bound to copper and act, having it act on this particular precursor, alkyne and azide, to make an oligotriazole ligand that once bound to copper would create more catalyst and that would complete this autocatalytic cycle. And so we set about to try to then utilize this kind of concept of autocatalysis and couple it to the creation of these phospholipid membranes, these compartments. And so to do that, on one hand, we have this autocatalytic reaction where we actually created a hydrophobic tail and used this alkyne species as actually three alkynes, when these click together, they form this ligand now, oligotriazole, that once it binds copper, forms a catalyst species. That catalyst species can catalyze its own reaction, its own formation. And so that's an autocatalytic cycle. 
And simultaneously, this catalyst here, which I've kind of depicted as a sort of green <laughs> a molecule here, a sort of a symbol here, this catalyst can also act on a long chain azide and a phospholipid precursor to make an artificial phospholipid, which is the core component of these compartments. Okay, so now you have these two things going on in parallel. One is to make catalysts, one is to make compartments. What about cross reactions? Isn't that gonna be a problem? So for that, we did a little trick where we basically used a common precursor. So there's this common precursor, and so now we don't have this issue necessarily of cross reactivity. All the reactions are productive. The reactions either lead to more catalysts or the reactions lead to more membrane. And so now we can have this sort of catalytic membrane where you have the, the catalyst species in green here and these phospholipids, and you can feed it these reactive small molecule precursors, and the entire membrane can synthesize itself and still be continue to be catalytically active. We don't get dilution of the catalytic species because the catalytic species is able to make more of itself. A little bit briefly about how do we do characterization? How do we know what we're making? We can use light scattering to measure the size of these compartments. And these compartments tend to often be in the hundreds of nanometers size regime. We can use what's known as electron microscopy to actually visualize the compartments themselves. So you can see them here. And then to monitor the chemistry, we use very advanced methods to separate molecules, liquid chromatography, to be able to observe the different molecules we make, and that coupled with methods to identify what those molecules are, such as mass spectrometry, actually let us, to, let us follow and quantitate these reactions. And so one of the first things we wanted to do was to just basically verify, do these separate concepts work independently of one another? So for instance, can we actually get catalyst self-reproduction to work in these compartments, in these lipid vesicles? And so all we're doing here is showing that if we add this uh, catalyst species and we have these precursors, we can actually make more of the catalyst species. And we actually have this very interesting slow buildup of material that accelerates with time. And that's because you're making more catalyst. So the reaction's actually getting faster. And if you, in fact, start with more catalyst at the beginning, well, it, the reaction is even faster still. We can also show that we, that lipid synthesis, the formation of this key building block of these compartments is dependent on the amount of catalyst you have. So if we increase the amount of catalyst, which is shown here as we're going from here to here, we're increasing the catalyst amount, the lipid synthesis is occurring faster. And so then we can bring it all together. So here what we can do is we can actually show then that we can have this coupled synthesis of the catalyst and more lipid material. And what's kind of neat about this particular experiment is that we actually did two experiments three experiments, including a control. We did one experiment, we, we did this with a certain amount of, um, of, of, of catalyst. And then we did another experiment where we actually added this scaffold so that we could make more catalyst in situ. And when we did that, we actually generated more of this phospholipid, this compartment. And so what this basically shows is that these things are intimately connected. If we can make more of the catalyst, we can make more of the phospholipid membrane. And so because the system now can sort of perpetuate, because it can basically reproduce itself in entirety, we can actually do experiments where we can see how much we can propagate these membranes, similar in some ways to how you sort of propagate cells. So we can take um, a, a, a group of these catalytic vesicles and we can just throw away 90% of these membranes. And then to the remaining membranes, add these precursors, and with time, watch the formation of new catalytic membranes. 
and then we can throw away 90% of those, add precursors, and watch the formation of new membranes. And we can repeat this over and over again. And again, if you didn't have this ability of the catalyst to make more of itself, you would eventually get dilution of the catalyst and cessation. But in this case, we don't see that. So this is just following product formation. And so here at these arrows, we discard 90% of the material and we watch complete buildup of new material. We throw away 90%, build up of new material. Throw away 90%, continued on and on. In fact, the student who did this work did this for 500 hours and could have done it longer, but clearly had better things to do. <laughs> so then we were really curious. Okay, so we had shown this ability of this material to propagate. What happens to the vesicles themselves? <clears throat> So we can imagine if we have a compartment that's got this catalyst and we feed it these precursors, maybe these precursors go into the compartment and expand the membrane, expand the compartment and cause it to grow. And of course, growth is one of the hallmarks of, of cells. And so what we're gonna show here is a movie now where we're actually watching using microscopy um, some of these membranes and we've added these precursors. And this is now over um, some time, but you can actually see now these vesicles growing in response to incorporating these new precursors. It's very heterogeneous. It's not like what if you if you download a movie of cell division, it's actually very, very carefully orchestrated. This kind of growth, the vesicles are very heterogeneous, different sizes but we definitely see this growth. And in fact, it's not just one vesicle, so we can use microscopy and software to actually monitor thousands of vesicles. And when you do this, you can actually observe these vesicles growing with time. So you can see them getting bigger from here to here over many hours. And so we can actually do statistics on this. And again, like I said, it's very heterogeneous. Um, you have many vesicles that don't grow very much, but you have others that grow a lot. And, but on average, we see this vesicle, the, the population of vesicles getting larger in size. So we have a system now that has sort of multiple types of precursors, and it sort of starts asking questions about, well, is there any actual selectivity that these catalytic vesicles have for one type of molecule or another type of molecule. And so you can actually expose these membranes to mixtures of different kinds of these hydrophobic chains. And so in this particular example, it's a very, very simple example, we just changed the chain length. We exposed it to two options of chain length. One that has 12 carbons and one that has 16 carbons. And so we just give them a one-to-one -one mixture. And naively, you might think if there's no real preference, then a one-to-one -one mixture of product would be um, observed. And that's not what we see. In fact, we actually see a real preference for the longer chain, the 16 carbon um, longer chain precursor. Both in the compartment material, that phospholipid, and in the catalyst. But what's also very interesting is, in fact, we can change the environment. So in this case, we just changed the concentration of salts in the buffer. And when we do that, we actually see a change in the amount of the ratio of incorporation of these two precursors. You get even more longer chain precursor incorporated. And so that's really interesting. And why do we see that? Well, we can speculate we did notice that the uh, rate of reaction slows down as you increase the salt concentration. And it's thought that these longer chain precursors would basically reside in these membranes longer and thus have a more probability of reacting with the alkyne. But nonetheless, what's interesting about this is it kind of resembles an ability of living organisms to sort of adapt to the environment. And in fact, there's a really great example with respect to lipid membranes. So our lipid membranes, we typically want them to be fluid-like. 
And if you decrease the temperature, that causes a lot loss of fluidity in our membranes. And so what cells have developed is a ways to make other kinds of lipids that maintain that fluidity, that are actually more resistant to these temperature drops. And in fact, we will change our lipid membrane composition in response to this environmental change and adapt to it. And, and there are other organisms that do this as well. So this is, I think, sort of interesting and points this idea of maybe these kinds of even very, very simple chemical systems can show some aspect of adaptation. Now, even though I'm focusing on uh, the bottom-up ways of creating these sort of minimal cells, I want to take a moment and describe an example, not from our lab, from another lab in the United Kingdom that has taken a very interesting top-down approach. And I do this because I'd like to illustrate that I think there are going to be opportunities where the top-down and bottom-up approaches will be complementary and we can actually learn from one another. And so this is from the lab of Jeff Arrington in the United Kingdom. And what he really showed in some extremely beautiful papers is he was able to take bacteria. And bacteria normally have a cell wall and they have a protein that helps with the division of bacteria, a cytoskeletal-like protein. And he was able to create, by removing these items in various ways, he was able to take away the cell walls and take away that cytoskeletal protein. So the bacteria now sort of lost their rod-like shape and they were more spherical. And really surprisingly, these bacteria could still divide even though they, the cytoskeletal machinery in the wall were gone. And it wasn't very pretty. I'm going to play a movie here that's from their lab where you can see this um, now strange sort of modified bacteria can still divide and grow. And what they found in follow-up work is that there was real evidence of this division. Like, how is this actual division occurring? That it was driven by excess synthesis of lipids. And they knew this because when they, there were particular lipids were very important for this division, so-called branch chain lipids that help with the fluidity of the membrane. And if they actually took away the ability to make these branch chain lipids, then these organisms couldn't divide anymore. And so how would this occur? The thinking is, well, perhaps as you expand the surface area of these cells, and if you maintain the volume, well, then there's going to be a stress there as you keep on expanding the surface area and trying to maintain the same volume. And one way of relieving that is to have division. But I think this really points to an interesting opportunity. We've been developing these kinds of minimal artificial cells, if you will, that use lipid synthesis to, to grow. And then there are also these minimal living cells from the top down that are basically able to grow and divide through potentially lipid synthesis. And so there's this kind of interesting opportunity where the bottom up approach might start meeting the top down approach. And in fact, in our lab, we're now starting to make lipids like the lipids that were observed by Arrington in these bacteria to see if they help with the growth and division of our sort of minimal bottom up artificial cells. And so I think that's going to be a really exciting um, future opportunity where bottom up and top down meets. Now, there are, of course, a lot of challenges and problems um, in our approach. And so I want to be very transparent about, you know, obviously this is a very nascent area of research. One issue is we're providing these rather, you know, in some ways complicated activated precursors. We have these pretty exotic functional groups, azides and alkynes, and we have to constantly provide them and they're synthesized. In the future, can we think about mimicking biology the way it uses sort of very simple energy sources like light or chemical fuels like ATP to um, propagate the system? Is that something that we can work on? And, and that's, that's uh, something that in our lab is very excited about pursuing. Additionally, our system, even though it kind of adapt and it seems to change composition based on the environment, 
it doesn't, there isn't really any information that we think of, for example, like DNA or RNA. There, there isn't really a memory. How does, how does a system sort of persist once it's you know, changed its composition? There's been some ideas in literature from scientists like Doran Lancet suggesting that the actual composition of lipids could provide information, but this is still a, an, an open question. Additionally, as you saw from some of these videos, the growth and division is, is quite messy, it's heterogeneous. Are there ways that we can make this um, more homogenous? One issue is we're using these sort of long chain hydrophobic precursors that can potentially disrupt membranes that might be contributing to the heterogeneous nature. And so we're working on ways to try to get around this issue. And then finally, and this is gonna sort of dovetail to the second part of my talk, you know, there's a lot of interest in synthetic biology for applications, right? Creating new kinds of enzymes, drugs, fuels. What we're doing here, if it's very, very basic, very using very exotic small molecules, we're, we're very far from that. We're, and we're not really gonna be able to help with these kinds of applications. And so this is a big challenge. And so I think that's why our lab has also been interested in thinking about bottom-up construction of synthetic cells and, and lifelike materials using biological parts. And so the idea here is, well, in biochemistry, we've been very good at being able to isolate various kinds of biological machinery. So for instance, DNA synthesis and um, the translation of proteins and synthesis of lipids and metabolic pathways. Can we actually take those isolated parts that are not living and put, in, put them together in a meaningful way to mimic certain functions seen in life and eventually even try to um, create something that would be living. And why would we wanna do this? Well, one idea would be to, again, thinking about bottom-up construction of artificial cells, where now if you're using biological parts, you can immediately plug into these potential applications that would one would be interested in actual proteins, for example. But also, there's been a real revolution over the last 20 years in synthetic biology and the idea that we can really try to um, manipulate and engineer biology. And what has often been talked about is this idea that we can, you know, with the same kind of control that we engineer, for example, electrical circuits, that we could apply this to biology. And this has been actually there's been some amazing successes, but it's also been really challenging. And one of the re reasons it's very challenging is because biology is very complex. And when we work with living organisms like bacteria and yeast that are very complicated, there are a lot of interactions that we don't know about or that are hard to predict. And so if we could actually take a minimal group of biological parts and put them together such that we know everything that's inside now this sort of artificial cell, that might give us a little bit more control and predictability when we want to engineer biology. And so my laboratory, our background is in chemistry, and we were really interested then in the idea of trying to put together biological parts. And we thought, well, why stop there? We could also combine the biological parts with chemical and material parts as well, with abiological components. So could we create hybrid materials where we combine sort of the control, the predictability, the programmability of, of artificial components with the sort of amazing properties that a billion years of evolution or more that biology has to create these kind of hybrid uh, systems. And so there have been some really great examples as I kind of briefly detailed previously of creating sort of artificial cells from a mixture of biological and abiological parts. And recently in our lab, we wanna take this sort of one step further and think about ways in which we can actually get these sorts of cell mimics to work together and communicate with one another. So now going beyond just synthetic cell and think about how we could get sort of a colony of synthetic cells to work amongst each other to have some kind of higher order function. 
And of course, our inspiration for this and everything else in our lab really is biology. And so in biology, there's really great examples of functional cell-cell communication. So a good example is pattern development during um, the development of multicellular organisms, so during embryogenesis. Additionally, there's a phenomenon that some of you may know about called quorum sensing in bacteria, where bacteria are able to sense the density of themselves and produce molecules so they can coordinate behavior. And so a really uh, talented uh, postdoc in my lab, Henrike Niederholtmeier, decided to take on this goal of trying to get these sort of cell mimics to be able to communicate with one another. And so her idea then was to try to get these sort of cell mimics to communicate through protein signals. But we wanted each cell to have an identity. So we wanted each cell to have information or DNA, and we needed that information to be retained. Additionally, we wanted our capsules because we wanted to create these hybrid cell mimic materials. We want them to be very stable and robust. We want them to be easy to produce in large quantities. And so we came up with this sort of general idea where perhaps what we need is a permeable container, a permeable membrane, so we could feed the system with sort of everything it needs to do protein production, and the proteins could then diffuse out and communicate with other kinds of cell mimics. But then we'd also need to have a way to entrap the genome inside so that information itself didn't just leak out and, you would, and you'd lose the cellular identity. And so how then do we go from these individual artificial cells to communities of artificial cells? We wanted then to have these permeable membrane such that now you can express and release signaling proteins, and these signaling proteins could then act on neighboring synthetic cells to have some kind of function. And so what Henrique uh, decided to, to land on then was to try to use polymers that were very porous and create these capsules, if you will, that would mimic cells such that they could actually express genes and produce proteins. And so what she created then were these rather large capsules, they're 40 microns in diameter. They've got a, a porous polymer shell. And inside, they have a, a hydrogel that we sort of affectionately call an artificial nucleus. And we call it an artificial nucleus because inside this hydrogel, she's able to entrap DNA. So that's the information. And because that DNA is entrapped in that hydrogel, the DNA doesn't escape across the porous membrane. It's stuck in that hydrogel. That's essentially another compartment within a compartment. And with the right types of reagents, you can actually get these capsules to synthesize proteins. The polymer membrane is very porous, so large proteins can actually diffuse in and out, no problem. And that allows then you to potentially exchange proteins and signals with other synthetic cells. So how does Henrique produce these? So she actually uses what are known as microfluidic techniques. So she can create these really beautiful droplets where in this device you can feed in a inner aqueous phase with a middle oily phase and an outer aqueous phase and you get these double emulsion droplets. This is just a video here of producing lots and lots of these droplets. And by having these different phases, these water phases and oil phases, it allows you to actually control where you put certain materials. So in the inner aqueous phase, we can put the precursors to this hydrogel, these clay precursors, and DNA. In the oily phase, we can actually put monomers for a polymerization. And so after you make all these droplets, you can actually shine UV light on them and can do a controlled polymerization forming a porous polymer shell. And then you can also trigger the formation of this clay DNA hydrogel nucleus. And so this allows you in a pretty scalable way to make thousands and thousands of these cell mimics. This clay uh, material is based on some previous work and 
that would show that, in fact, you can bind DNA to these clays. And, in fact, they have the ability to really capture quite a bit of DNA and bind it very tightly. And so we also looked at the sort of the permeability of these systems using microscopy techniques and looking at whether or not certain kinds of molecules can get in and out of both the outer capsule wall, which is shown here. So here she's actually cracked one open like an egg. And you can see these, you can use various kinds of electron microscopy to see there's very, very large pores. So large, in fact, that green fluorescent proteins, large polymers, huge, two megadalton, even ribosomal proteins can go in and out of this wall. The, but if you start putting very large materials like nanoparticles, these are 200 nanometer or so uh, particles, these are excluded from the interior of the capsule. And so now you have these capsules that have this polymer shell and they have this uh, nucleus, if you will, it turns out that there's some really beautiful systems out there where we, we can take reagents that as long as there's DNA present, you can actually get the transcription of RNA and the translation of proteins. And so she can bathe these capsules with those reagents and it can actually lead to the production of mRNA and protein. And this is what will be needed to get the capsules now to start sort of communicating with one another. There's another issue in that if you have a very porous wall and now these capsules start producing protein, isn't the protein just going to leak out? How do you sort of visualize it? How do you know you're making the protein? And so what Enrique did was some inspiration for what you observed with certain nuclear proteins is she decided to create a reporter protein. So this is a classic green fluorescent protein. It's a protein that gives off light when you shine light on it. And she fused it to another protein. This is a yellow square here. It's a DNA binding protein. And so the logic behind this is if in this hydrogel nucleus you keep domains that will bind to the DNA binding protein, then once you produce this fluorescent, this light-giving protein, it should bind to the DNA containing hydrogel. And that nucleus, if you will, should light up if you get protein expression. And so she basically took her capsules now that have these artificial nuclei and bathed them in these reagents. And to our delight, you could see the nuclei light up as protein is being produced this green fluorescent protein. And this occurs over the period of hours. So these cell mimics, if you will, are, 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 are porous. They can exchange proteins with one another. And you can encode different kinds of information in different capsules and mix them together. So in this experiment, what Enrique has done is she's created capsules that can produce green protein She's created capsules that can produce a red protein. And you can then put the green capsules on one side of a channel and the red capsules on the other side of the channel and see what happens. And in the middle of the channel where these two populations meet, we do indeed get exchange of the proteins with one another. They have the same ability to bind to the same type of DNA. So the Capsules encoding for green protein and produce green protein, it may bind on that capsule, it may bind on a neighboring capsule. But if you look further away from that interface, we only see green and we only see the um, M cherry or red protein. And so that actually implies that there is localization. And the distance between cell mimics matters. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons we think is because the RNA that you're producing has a finite lifetime in these mixtures. It turns out it can degrade pretty rapidly. And so that might be limiting the ability of exchange. But we can create then, we can actually sort of decouple the functions. So we can create capsules that produce protein, but they don't bind it. And mix them with capsules that bind protein, but don't produce it. And so now 
in order to see the um, protein light up nuclei, you actually have to have both of these capsules. And so we can call these sort of sender capsules and receiver capsules. And so here's a movie I'm going to play where we have a uh, sender capsule here in purple. And so one of the nice things about working with these polymers is we can actually stain the polymers different colors. It makes it very easy to identify. And we can actually change the size of these capsules by changing the microfluidics. But in this case, we have a sender here in purple. And it's actually surrounded, you can't see it now, by lots and lots of these receiver capsules. And when you trigger protein expression, you can actually see these receiver capsules lighting up. And if you pay close attention, you can see that the receivers that are close to the sender are lighting up first. And this has some resemblance to what's observed in biology during development to the formation of morphogen gradients. And in fact, you can now look at a field of thousands of these capsules and what we kind of affectionately like to call a synthetic tissue, if you will, that has multiple of these cell mimics. And actually, there are receiver capsules everywhere. And you can see these sender capsules are in purple. And you can see that the receiver capsules around the sender capsules are lighting up, creating this kind of a pattern, if you will. And so we wanted to be able to mimic some kind of a higher order function. And as I mentioned, one of our inspirations for getting into this was to think about quorum sensing. So quorum sensing is this system of stimuli and response that's correlated to the population density of the organisms. And so bacteria use this as a means of restricting gene expression to when it's most beneficial. So a classic example of this is when bacteria form microcolonies, they can sense each other, and it actually leads to biofilm formation. Another way of thinking about this, it's decision making, but in a completely decentralized manner. And so we built into the system a very, very simple genetic circuit that makes the expression of that green fluorescent protein reporter dependent on the density of these capsules. So these capsules have porous membranes. They're able to produce proteins. If you have a certain threshold of protein built up, then you get expression of the reporter. And when you do that, now what Henrique has done is she's added these capsules into these micro well plates. And here we have 94 capsules, 333 capsules, 404 capsules, 498 capsules. And at a certain threshold density of capsules, we actually get a turning on of that green fluorescent protein expression. This is another experiment essentially saying the same thing, but here what she's done that's really kind of clever is she's taken a channel and she has sort of scattered these capsules in a way that on the left side of the channel they're sparse and on the right side they're dense. The left side that just pay attention here to the green channel in the middle, we don't see it lighting up and on the right side we see the green channel lighting up. And so essentially now these capsules are sensing their own density. And so what we were able to achieve then is this sort of higher order behavior is artificial quorum sensing in populations of these cell mimics through the ability at high density to produce lots of a signaling protein. Now, where can we go from here? So one of the, you know, we have a system now where we have a cell wall, we've got a sort of nucleus, if you will, can we build other kinds of compartments and organelles, if you will, into this system? And so we've been, as I discussed in the first part of our talk, we have a pretty big program in creating various kinds of lipid membranes. Can we combine that and actually create separate lipid membrane-based organelles in these capsules? But another area that we've made some progress on is, again, taking advantage of sort of these hybrid materials. So we're making these artificial polymers there's the potential to do some really exciting chemistry there. And so we've actually been able to functionalize the polymers of these cell walls and functionalize them in such a way that they can bind proteins that would be expressed in these um, cell-free systems. And so in this case, what we've done is we've actually put a, a molecule onto the polymer such that it binds a, a green fluorescent protein 
that has what's known as a histidine tag on it. And so now, in fact, this green wall is basically the is basically depicting the capture of a protein using this specially functionalized system. And so this, I guess, again, presents some opportunities for controlling in space and time um, chemistries in these kinds of systems. Now, we have, we have created a system where we have free diffusion of mRNA and proteins, and we have sort of spatially fixed DNA in these hydrogels. And we have a, a variety of protein binding sites in this network. And so, of course, most cells, right, are not having free diffusion of mRNA and proteins. That's not how cells work. But this actually resembles a pretty interesting phenomenon in biology, which is known as uh, syncytium. So, and a good example of this is in Drosophila development. So in embryogenesis, in development phase, there's actually a period of nuclear divisions without cell division. And um, this forms then what's known as a syncytium, where you have all of these sort of nuclei, which is sort of the spatially fixed DNA, but now you have free diffusion of mRNA and proteins. And that may allow the establishment of certain gradients to form during development. And so one of the things we're interested in doing with these sort of synthetic tissues, if you will, is to study the formation of various kinds of biochemical now reaction diffusion patterns. So we have these spatially fixed genomes, can we start to get interesting patterns to form and using these sort of fluorescent proteins as um, markers of expression? And so one of the things we've been working on is whether or not we can get sort of a, a wave of gene expression to occur and propagate over the tissue. And perhaps more ambitious, but what would be really exciting is can we actually get very complex patterns like Turing patterns to spontaneously form in these um, two-dimensional tissues? And so what are some of the, the challenges, just to finish up for this, for this area? Well, one is what sort of the advantages of creating these compartmentalized structures, these so-called artificial cells or synthetic cells versus just a completely cell-free system. So there's some really good applications out there, really great um, technology out there to do gene expression in a completely cell-free media. And I think really the answer there is the ability to gain spatial control over processes through compartmentalization. And additionally, in the case of these synthetic cells, we can use lipid membranes. And in fact, there are, there's a huge array of very important proteins that need lipid membranes for their function. And those are very difficult to harness in, this, in, in completely cell-free systems versus these systems that potentially could have lipid membranes built into them, which would be considered artificial cells or synthetic cells. And kind of related to that is one of the real big problems, which really kind of great about living organisms is you can you know, shine light on them, you can feed them um, sugar, simple sugars, and they can propagate. In all these cell-free systems, we have an issue with, in terms of how do we sort of provide energy to the system, and that can be really expensive. So can we build into the system ways to have energy regeneration or very simple metabolic networks so that that becomes easier to do? And then finally, in the systems I showed today with this sort of very rigid cell wall, the system isn't growing or dividing. And so that could be a bad thing. You know, obviously to try to really mimic life, we would like to have reproduction and division. The alternatively, it could be a good thing in the sense that um, sometimes if you want a device, we want it to be stable. We don't want it to change. And so actually preventing growth and division um, could be beneficial. But it's something for the field to think about. And with that, I'll finish up and um, thank all of my group members. I think I, I talked about some of them today, but really they're the ones that are doing the work. And um, it's been really great to uh, be able to really a privilege to work with such a dedicated and intelligent group of uh, coworkers. I want to also thank all of the um, funding that we've received that's helped make, that really is needed for this work to happen. And again, I want to thank PSW for the invitation and I want to thank you for your patient attention.
So we have a procedure for questions. There are three different microphones. There's a red microphone, a blue microphone, and a black microphone. And I'm going to go in the order red, blue, black. Keep your hand up long enough for the microphone runners to see you. And eventually, if you're persistent, they will bring a microphone to you. So I think I'm going to start with the red microphone, if you'll get it to somebody. And you are to please stand, tell us your name, Tell us if you're a member and ask a question. All dialogue, speeches, polemics are saved for the social hour. This is the question and answer period. And we will take some questions from the pink microphone, which is our live chat from people all over the world. Red microphone, you're up. I'm recalling some work we saw here due to Lee Cronin at the University of Glasgow in a similar vein. I was curious if you briefly or fulsomely compare and contrast what you're doing with the uh, work of the Cronin group on the prebiotics of life. Yeah, so um, in fact, interestingly enough, I was just in Glasgow visiting the Cronin lab and um, so some of the one, one sort of simple way to contrast is that a lot of the work that we're doing isn't necessarily, you know, strictly in a strict sense relevant to sort of prebiotic chemistry. As I pointed out, we're using very exotic functional groups, azides and alkynes. These were not likely, you know, relevant to the prebiotic um, earth. So in a way, a lot of the work they're doing, particularly in trying to understand, you know, very simple chemical reactions and trying to understand sort of the, the, the complexity required to define whether or not something may have come from a living organism, very, very relevant to sort of prebiotic chemistry and exobiology. But um, in our work, it's much more separated from that. And I think what we're really maybe going toward is trying to understand this question of what are sort of the principles that would have led to things like reproducing compartments? And so we're maybe taking a different approach. We're using things that are not necessarily, that, that are not prebiotically relevant, but may still help us in terms of understanding maybe more fundamental principles. So yes, the azides and alkynes are not prebiotically relevant, but maybe there were other types of functional groups that were. I think we're at the blue microphone. If you will give the red microphone to someone else. Okay, blue microphone, where are you? There's no blue microphone, we'll go on to the black microphone. Is the black microphone somewhere? Okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Naraj Trivedi, uh, not a member. And so I, I have like 50 questions, so I'll just stick with You only uh, get couple. two. Okay, two. Well, that's yeah, well, good. a lot of people steal a second one, so I'll give it to you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so one of the questions I have when in creating my cells and uh, the, the lipid bilayer um, in the vesicles, you know, it's all primarily phospholipids. So have you thought or have other groups looked at putting channels in there, so different sodium channels and receptors and so on, just to give it more of a, you know, more of an organic feel, I guess, to it. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And in fact, our group has, um, had a, has a very active interest in this area. So when you spontaneously create these membranes, in fact, we've shown that if you have channel proteins or transmembrane proteins present during that formation, they get spontaneously incorporated and they're functional. Gotcha. And so I think this again, sort of as, as I was ending and talking about the opportunity to think about energy regeneration and uh, work with membrane proteins and the benefits of compartmentalization, it starts opening up the idea of making things like, can you make an artificial mitochondria, for example? Right. right. Which is a great question and leads to my second question that you gave me. So one of the interesting things, um, in biology is these concept of housekeeping genes, where these genes are uh, genes that don't change their gene expression, but they're, they say they're fundamental to the function of the life of a cell. And so as you're creating these artificial cells and these genes, have you found sort of the um, 
you know, the minimal gene set requirement or these housekeeping genes, because they're also a little controversial that, you know, are these genes really necessary and do these genes really change? So if you can comment on that, that would be great. <clears throat> I mean, I think the, the short answer is it's we're still at an early enough stage that I don't think we can say yet, oh, these are needed or not needed. Um, that being said, you know, certain kinds of proteins like chaperones and we're, we are investigating how they impact. And I think this is an interesting playground to ask those exact kind of questions to see how does it, you know, really affect a, a, a very minimal isolated system. Do we have a question from the chat line? Hear me? Testing, yep. We have two questions from our online viewers. The first one is from Neil, and he is streaming from the country of Colombia, and he wanted to ask the speaker if you had any comments or insight on the theory of panspermia, which is the theory that life on Earth originated from microorganisms or chemical precursors of life present in outer space and able to initiate life on reaching a suitable environment. Yeah, it was interesting because we were, in fact, briefly discussing this at dinner. Um, well, one, I'll say that I think this is a very interesting theory. And um, some people talk about this as sort of, okay, well, well, this would explain sort of the origin of life. Well, perhaps it would explain the origin of life on Earth but it sort of kicks the question down the road in the sense that, well, how did life originate wherever it came from? Um, and so uh, I think that's really what I, I, can, I can say about that. Um, I think that's an, it's an of course, it's, you know, again, it, it points to the idea of how sort of challenging this question is of how life originated, that, uh, you know, did it happen here? Did it come from somewhere else? It's still hard to say, right? Thank you. The second question is from Merle, not a member. What percentage of repetitive seawater current motion is thought to be fundamental in lipid cell formation? Is motion a key factor after chemistry? So can you repeat the first part of the question? Yep. What percentage of repetitive seawater current motion is oh, thought to be fundamental in lipid yeah. cell formation? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I don't, I think it's, uh, it's probably very important. I don't think we've done very good, you know, ex experiments to test the effect of um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, agitation, for example. It, it, def it definitely, I would think it affects the size of um, some of the kinds of vesicles you make. Now, there's some really interesting work and, and ideas out there about how vesicles may have formed in the ocean. And actually, not not in water, but actually at the air-water interface. And in fact, the, the idea is that at the air-water interface, organic molecules may have resided um, and been kicked up in the form of aerosols, and then gone back into the water. And, and through this kind of repetitive action, could have led to vesicle formation. I think that's a really exciting idea. Red microphone, please. I'm sorry, red microphone. Uh, good evening. Name and member? Uh, Langston McKee, and I am not a member. Uh, I was, my question had to do with the memory function of the catalyst. So I was curious if your lab had tried additional lipid products that uh, might form a memory basis that could be continued similar to what you've already accomplished. But... Um, using either a different metal or different precursors. You mentioned that you'd use some different precursors, but um, that just seemed to be a difference in length. Mm -hmm. If you've done anything more fundamental, I'd be interested in hearing more about it. Yeah, so we have, um, it's a great question. So one of the things we did that was very different, and I was tempted to put it into this talk a little bit, but now that you've asked this question, you give me a great opportunity to, to talk about it, is that this idea of using this autocatalysis that's copper-based. So to answer your question about other metals, we've focused on copper because we've been use, utilizing for the autocatalysis this um, copper-catalyzed reaction. It turns out that you know, mechanisms to have autocatalysis in water, not very common. In fact, that's kind of a great area of research. Um, but 
we have utilized this triazole autocatalysis to make radically different kinds of compartments. So rather than having just, you know, hydrophobic tails at different lengths, we've actually done work where we've taken amino acids and short peptides and done autocatalysis to make these sort of very interesting molecules that are hybrid peptide with simple organic molecules and triazoles, and they actually can self-assemble and form peptide-based compartments. And the thing we're interested in doing and we're beginning to work on now is can we start changing the, the lipid tails in a way to make the membranes more fl fluid? And one thing that we really want to do is to look at these branch chain uh, lipids. Yeah. Do we have the uh, blue mic somewhere? Do we have the black mic somewhere? Okay, black microphone it is. Okay, uh, Ying Huang, uh, I'm not a member. So I'll just keep uh, within two questions. So the <laughs> first one is uh, about uh, the auto uh, catalytic reactions you've mentioned. So there are two choices, either the production of the um, membrane or the uh, production of the catalyst. So I'm wondering, do you see any preference in uh, production of either products? Uh, I mean, how they will choose which way to go? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, actually, we didn't look into that. So um, we really focused on, in terms of preference, looking at choosing the precursors. We, um, to control sort of the output, there's two different reactive partners that alkyl azide can react with. One is the scaffold and one is the lipid precursor. And to sort of bias the output, we change the concentrations. Um, I think that you're asking a great question. That's something that we can look into. So uh, the, the second one is uh, a general one. So uh, I'm wondering, do you think if we give another chance to the nature, do you think uh, the evolution will give uh, uh, a more uh, economic way in uh, various kind of process? Or in other words, do you think that the bottom-up strategy will help us to find some uh, better ways uh, to solve some problems. Okay, thank you. Being an optimist, I think so. Um, <laughs> I think one of the, um, you know, working from the bottom up, we can really focus on maybe what our desired application is in terms of an application standpoint. So if it's really to produce some particular chemical or material, if we can make it from the bottom up, perhaps we have an opportunity to make it extremely efficient, maybe more so than a system that's also doing a lot of other things that are not necessarily needed for the application that's desired. Carl, the red microphone. Uh, Carl Merrill, I'm a member. <clears throat> you, uh, in, in your talk, you talked about making messenger RNA and protein but making messenger RNA requires a rather complex enzyme, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and to make a protein is even worse because you need a polysome, and I didn't see anything like that there, unless you're calling the binding of two different subunits protein synthesis. So maybe I, I misunderstood, but I have one more thing, and that is I, uh, azides are generally bactericidal, and, and it, you know, they're, they're not compatible with most forms of life. So I wondered if you could comment on that too. Okay, so second question first, because it's easier to answer. So sodium azide is incompatible because it binds and inhibits enzymes. Organic azides are, are not, don't behave in the same way. Um, for your first question, yeah, I basically didn't go into the details, but basically this mixture that we're exposing these capsules to contains all of those complex enzymes and ribosomes and, and things of that nature. And in fact, there are um, ways in which you can you know, make that kind of system from lysates, or there are groups, particularly um, a very well-known system is a pure system where you can actually recombinantly express all these proteins and then also add ribosomes and get transcription and translation. So you're all also adding ATP then? Yes, absolutely. And that's where I think the energy regeneration, because what we found in our system is that, um, and, and other people have found this, is that basically at some time the ATP gets consumed and rather quickly and it stops producing. 
So um, can you develop a way to more effectively regenerate the ATP? But you're not up yet. Hang on. Pink microphone. Let's keep the mics on, folks. Don't do anything. The red one's on. It's fine. Hello. Seth, I'm a member. I was wondering if there's anything analogous to the uh, Liga... Um, triazone? Yeah, Liga triazone in our biology and the um, DNA binding clays. So the... the oh, okay. So the question was, um, <clears throat> is there anything similar in our biology to um, the oligotriazoles autocatalyst that I talked about? And the second part, um, remind me again, what was the second question? Oh, um, I had a separate question from that, but the other was on anything analogous to the pro or yeah, the DNA binding clays. Oh, right. And is there anything analogous to the DNA binding clay? So um, the DNA binding clays, yes. In fact, we basically borrowed that from biology. So that's absolutely true. Um, the oligotriazole autocatalysis, um, currently not to my knowledge. So this is really, I think, one of the challenges of this sort of bottom up from small molecules is how do we, you know, do something that's radically different in, um, you know, current life, it is auto, there is autopoiesis, it's able to you know, completely reproduce itself, but through this really complex interplay of, you know, um, DNA and proteins and RNA. Um, and so to have like one, you know, molecule driving everything and self reproducing itself, not so much. But I think the thinking is, and if you read some of the origin of life literature, that something like that may have occurred in sort of the um, in the in sort of the protocell era. So one of the, the uh, ideas that's out there is that maybe there is a self-reproducing RNA that, that did this, that was able to catalyze its own production. A black microphone somewhere, and then the red microphone. Oh, yes, hello. My name's uh, Charlton Lewis. I'm not a member, but I did sign up this evening, so hopefully you all accept. All right. Thank you very much. Um, We're very so happy to have you. I'm a physicist by trade, so I always think about conservation of mass, energy, and in particular thermodynamics. And in your autocatalytic um, process that you had, I was curious um, uh, in terms of, um, I also call it second law thermodynamics, which you manifests itself in biology as waste from these processes. Um, so process, um, have you noticed any sort of rate limiting effect? I assume that maybe the reactions uh, that are taking place are just giving off excess energy, perhaps. Maybe they're like exothermic. It uh, doesn't seem like you have any weight. Is all that sort of in the noise at this point? Mimicry. That's a fantastic question. Um, I think, uh, so <clears throat> one of the things that's kind of nice about the system is because we use these very high energy precursors that we synthesize, there's limited waste um, with this, this kind of coupling reaction. But I think you, know, you bring up a really good point because waste is an important thing to think about. And so I'm hoping in next generation systems, we actually have that. <laughs> um, but one thing you kind of hit on is sort of like, what is sort of this rate limiting step? And so one, one thing that we notice that's really kind of interesting is um, obviously to make the phospholipid, you need the catalyst, this, this oligotriazole. Oh, um, but one thing we also observed is in fact, to make that oligotriazole, you need the lipid. And so if you actually try to make that oligotriazole, it's very, very hydrophobic, and it's got these th three hydrophobic alkyl chains, it's very, very slow in the absence of any membrane, presumably because it's so hydrophobic and it's just in water, and you, know, you actually need the membrane to help solubilize the precursors and help the reaction along. And once you have membrane, it goes much more rapidly. And so that's, I think, really interesting that there's sort of this cooperation between the two. So the red microphone, now regrettably we're, we're guiding to 10 o'clock, so I'm only gonna take a few more questions, but we'll start with the red microphone. 
David Rosen, lifetime member. Have you looked, have you worked with groups that, with inorganic, inorganic catalysts and inorganic scaffolds with, with your uh, micelles? Not, not completely inorganic. Um, so in a way, when we first started this work, the simple just copper ions would be inorganic. And, um, but you, you know, and, and actually one thing that I don't think we really um, followed up very much is this idea that maybe you could just use copper particles and things of that nature that would be completely inorganic. But no, we really haven't looked at um, completely inorganic scaffolds. So I think this may be our last question. So it should be a really, really good me? one. Okay, I hope so. My name is Sohail Ibrahimian. It's my first time attending. It's a pleasure. Excellent. I'm not a Welcome. member. Thank you. Um, going back to the catalyst, um, have you ever compared the activity of this oligotriazole copper binding catalyst to the actual enzymes that actually synthesize lipids in the cell? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the short answer is no. Um, we have just recently started thinking about, so one of the challenges has been that, um, so we've actually been doing some work now, even though we initially got into this thinking about ways to mimic the enzymatic sense and get away from the enzymes, we've actually now in our lab started thinking about using enzymes to make lipids. And we recently published a paper on, on this topic. So you may think, oh, well, you know, okay, you know, there's enzymes that um, make these phospholipids. Why don't you just reconstitute them? And then you're off to the races, right? And it turns out that a lot of these enzymes are challenging to reconstitute. They're membrane bound and they turn out to be not that efficient. So many groups, in fact, this has been going on, this kind of work has been going on in terms of reconstituting enzymes to make membranes, been going on for decades. And the yields are usually fairly, um, low and it's hard to get this to work very efficiently. So um, we've been now thinking about alternative ways in which we can try to use enzymes to drive lipid synthesis reactions. But in terms of like, I like your idea of how could you compare sort of this azide alkyne coupling step to the enzymatic step. And that's something that's uh, it's definitely something we should look into. Yeah, I don't want you to talk back and forth because you don't have a microphone. It won't show up on the live stream and it won't be recorded on the video. It's the only reason. And I think that's the last question. And I thank everybody in the audience for their attention and their uh, prescience and their questions. And I want to especially thank the speaker by presenting him with, grab the plaque here with a signed copy, with a framed copy of the announcement of his talk signed by all the members of the general committee on behalf of the membership, and also with a copy of volume one of the bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington signed uh, by me on behalf of the society membership. And volume one is very important because it lists why the society was founded, why it was called the Philosophical Society. It lists all of the original members who were luminaries of science in the United States at the time it was founded in 1871, many of who went on to found this institution, the Cosmos Club, the National Geographic Society, the Washington Academy of Sciences. Our first president was also the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I commend volume one to you and uh, to look into the history of some of our forebears here. And thank you all for continuing the traditions of this institution. Neil, thank you so much. Before we go, we have a few closing announcements. So PSW depends on members and sponsors. It is a participant organization. It shouldn't be just up to us to do everything. We need you to at least be members and hopefully some of you to volunteer to carry on the activities of the organization. Just for an instance, two of us had to get here at 3.30 
to set up for this. And we began our preparations to get here at 3.30 at 8.30 this morning. So there is a lot of work that goes into these meetings. Nobody's paid, it's all volunteers. And we would dearly like you to participate. If you have skills, skills and experience that you'd be willing to lend to the effort, particularly in the areas of videography, running cameras, setting up electronic equipment, and updating WordPress websites, we would like to talk to you. So please let us know. Beyond that, note the 2019 2020 dues notices have been sent some time ago. And if you have not yet paid your dues, please do so. And please consider making an additional donation, sponsoring a lecture, or even a series. And if you're not a member, we entreat you to join. You can apply for membership via the PSW website, www.psw.org. You'll notice the upper left-hand corner. That is the home page, and on the home page at the upper right-hand corner, there is a little join button, which you may imagine is how you can join via the website. When you press that button, in the normal fashion, it pulls up another page. Imagine that. And on that page, you will find a hyperlink. And if you press on the hyperlink, it will pull up the membership application. And if you'd be so kind as to fill out the membership application, including all the fields that have an asterisk, which is what's required to submit it, if you don't fill them all out, it will be rejected. And then when you get to the bottom and you've done all that, press this button, it will pull up the payment form. You don't have to use PayPal. PayPal is just the clearing agent. You may use your credit card or your debit card in the normal fashion just look for the tab that says credit card or debit card. If for some reason you just <clears throat> you decide to withdraw your application or you're rejected, which is very unusual because the main requirement is an interest in science. We don't give an IQ test. No degree is required. We will not cross-examination. We will not administer a cross-examination and um, we're happy to have you as a member. Uh, you will receive notification within about a week as to whether you've been elected to membership. Please note, PSW is still a nonprofit educational organization tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code and contributions are tax deductible to the extent permitted by law and by the IRS. All PSW members in good standing may wear the PSW rosette. If you wish to purchase one, it's $15 plus tax, and you may do so at the rosette, at the rosette table, and the rosette lady will, lady will be happy to help you, and McQueen over there. There. Our next lecture will be the 2,415th meeting of the Society, take place here in the Powell Auditorium on November 1st, 2019. The speaker will be George Ricker. George is the principal investigator of the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, TESS. George also is the director of the CCD lab at the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. His lecture will be on TESS's exoplanets, results of the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Mission. TESS is the premier exoplanet hunting satellite, especially now that the Kepler mission has ended. It can detect rocky, Earth-sized planets in the so-called Goldilocks zone around stars and what astronomers somewhat misleadingly call the solar neighborhood. TESS is taking us another step on the path to understanding planet formation by studying other solar systems and with that, help us gain a better idea of how often Earth-like planets occur and how many there are in the universe. 
The lecture is sponsored by PSW member Bob Terry. Thank you, Bob. He's in the audience somewhere, but he's hiding. The lecture number 2416 will be on November 15th, 2019, here in the Powell Auditorium. The speaker will be Dean Romich. He is Distinguished Professor of Oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego in beautiful La Jolla, California, north of San Diego. He will be talking on the Global Autonomous Ocean Sensor Flotilla, known as Argo, and the Global Integrated Observation Strategy. If you look here, that is a somewhat misleading map in which the size of the sensors is multiplied by about four or five orders of magnitude. But nonetheless, it does show that there are a lot of them out there floating around all over the world in the ocean. And they periodically report back information on salinity, temperature, ocean currents, and the like, and represent the largest data set and the largest continuous measurement system for the oceans that we have ever had. So it will be a very interesting talk. He can actually show you real data about what's going on in the oceans and their temperature. On December 6th, the last talk of the year, number 2417, we will have a talk by Harold Hess, who is a group leader at Howard Hughes Medical Institution, Janelia Farms. This is sponsored by PSW member Tim Thomas, who's not here with us tonight. He'll be talking about the brain in super resolution 3D. Now, Harold is a colleague and longtime coworker of Eric Betzig. Now, Eric Betzig won the Nobel Prize not too long ago for his work on super resolution microscopy, which are techniques for seeing with the microscope things that are smaller than the wavelength of light. In other words, it is a method and methods for seeing beyond the diffraction limit. Here, for thought to be impossible. In fact, let me say the consensus was you couldn't do that, which was proven to be wrong. And he has figured out methods for using super resolution microscopy and a 3D reconstruction methods to map the brain in ex extraordinary detail. I will next time post a good deal of the rest of the spring schedule, but for now, the President's lecture, which usually happens on January 10th, will be held instead on February 21st. The speaker will be Nobel Prize winner uh, Joachim Frank, who is one of the inventors of cryo-electron microscopy, which is a revolutionary method for determining the 3D structure of complex, large, supramolecular um, entities like ribosomes and viruses. Uh, it's a very important method and lots of interesting results, and that should be a fabulous lecture. And we're still determining who will be the speaker on the 10th. How many of you would love to hear a talk on the Supreme Court's recent rulings on patent law? Oh, I guess not. <laughs> my, the two students in my IP class are, are understandably enthusiastic. All right. And then um, on... January 24th, we will be hearing about Venus, uh, told to us by Ellen Stofan, who is the Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. The rest of the schedule will be posted to the website, so please check. The only other uh, talk I'll mention is that on May 15th, Shep Dolman will be speaking. Shep is the lead scientist on the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium that not long ago reported their historically significant first direct image of a black hole, which of course you can't really image. But they got the next best thing, which is the effects of the black hole on the surrounding universe. 
We'll also have talks by Jack Gilbert on the World Microbiome Project, Rajesh Rao on Brain Computer Interfaces, Henrik Christensen on Robotics, sponsored by PSW member Erica Kane, and I hope you'll all come and hear them. Let's thank tonight's video and room crew, James Healan on Minutes, Robin Taylor hiding in the back on live stream and video direction, Jared McQueen, Noah Block on cameras, Ann McQueen, live chat, and Rosettes, Laurel Kane, room manager at Best Girl, and our red, blue, and black mic runners, although we didn't have a blue one tonight, we had a pink one. So thank you all very much. And with that, let's not forget we live in a very exotic place, but we're not yet populating the moon. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting to the social hour? And do I have a second? Okay, the meeting is adjourned to the social hour. We will extend the social hour to 1045 tonight. Adjourned.